Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Let's pray. Father, I just pray that the time we spend in your Holy Scriptures this morning would really strengthen our faith. It would, Lord, do that, that work that only you can do in our hearts and our minds, Lord, even down into our spirit, our soul, Lord, that you can bring a refreshment, a strengthening by that work that, that your sweet Holy Spirit does in our lives, Lord. Let us all right now be able to take our cares. We cast them at your feet, Lord, the all the, the worries, all the troubles we had from this week. Lord, if it be with relationships or it be with bills or, or just bad vog, Lord, I just put all of those things at your feet right now. I ask that you would take care of them for us. We check them in t- with you, just like we would check a coat back east in the, in the restaurant when we would walk in and get the little claim ticket. We, we don't even need the claim ticket, Lord. We don't want it back. We just want to check all of our items in at your feet and give you all our cares. And we want to ask now that we be freed from those things so we could hear clearly what you want to speak to us. Speak to us now, we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone that agree with me said? Amen. Amen. Would you turn to 1 Corinthians 16? We are finally to the last chapter. The kids have told me I took 10 studies to do chapter 15. I will never make it through the whole Bible again at this rate. But... It's okay, you know, I, I see more now in the scripture. You know how they, it, to me, the scripture is like it, the analogy of the layer of the onion, you know, you, you, the first layer you see on the outside, you, you get one, one look at it. You know, it's got that, that papery skin and you think, you, oh, that's an onion, you know, you recognize what it is, but then you peel into it and, and it gets a little le- deeper layer and another layer. And in the scripture, the longer I've been a Christian, the deeper the, the truths of God's word come out and I think well that was in there all the time I just couldn't see it I was too busy looking at the outer part you know the 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 initial things that I saw in the Lord but the longer I'm in Christ the more I think wow this is really this is really deep you know the part that Paul talked about he he lit how many of you this week he ended the the chapter 15 last week with the hope that we have that we're not all going to die what what's going to happen that will keep us, the, the Christians, from dying. What is our hope? The Lord will return. And, and we went over that, that that was a hope that Jesus gave to, uh, to his disciples. He said, guys, don't, don't let your hearts be fearful. Don't let them be troubled. Anyone here ever feel like you got troubles that, that kind of choke out your faith a little? You get a little stressed out by stuff going on? Well, Jesus would say to you, don't let your heart be troubled, Joy. He would, he would say, in my Father's house are many what? Mansions. And I go to prepare a place for you. You guys know this, right? That the Lord goes to prepare a place for us. And he says, and if I go prepare a place for you, then I will come again to receive you to myself. In other words, I'm coming back for you. They were all freaked out. When Jesus said, I'm leaving, the disciples were like, no! We're, you know, like... We, we kind of got used to three years of free lunch and dinner. And, you know, every, Jesus took care of everything. I mean, can you imagine following Jesus in those early days? Those guys, everything that they needed, the Lord would go, go over here and get this. And then what do you got to feed the crowds with? Um, well, there's a kid here with a couple loaves and a few fish, you know. They snagged the kid's lunch. Jesus goes, that'll do. Blesses it, breaks it, and hands it to him and says, now, Tell everyone to sit down in groups of 50s and start handing it out. Now, I've always joked, but would any of you volunteer to go with me if we had a time machine? On that day, you guys know the story of the loaves and fish. Who would be with me to be a bread passer outer or fish passer out? I mean, if Jesus blessed it and said, here, and handed it to you, and you took it and you went over to a group of 50 people and you started going like this, and what happened with the bread when they were doing this? It never ran out, right? It just kept most. Does anyone think this would be fun? Besides me to just go, here you go. And you tear off a chunk. And then you look down and it's still there. And so you tear off a bigger chunk. 
you look down and it's back. And you, if you're just like, oh man, this is cool. I mean, that would be so, I think it'd be a little bit building for my faith, you know, to see the miracles that the good Lord did to supply for people. You know, Jesus said, I don't want to send this crowd away hungry. They've been here all this time listening to me. He said, they'll perish if I send them away. And interesting, he said to them, why don't you guys give them some food to eat before they go? And their answer was, Lord, if we had a hundred denaries worth of bread, if we, if we had 200, 300, if we had, in other words, a year's salary worth of bread, we couldn't feed this whole crowd. <coughs> now, you know Jesus was just setting it up. So what do you have? They're going, we don't got nothing. Anybody got something? And the little kid's going, I got some. My, you know, in, in their culture, the bread was like a little pita bread. You know, he's got his little sandwich bread with him, little pitas and a couple fish. And Jesus goes, that's enough. I would dig being there on that day to watch Jesus in action and to, and to be part, to participate in seeing him do his thing. But when he said, okay, guys, I'm going to go to the Father now. They're like, what? No. no. And, and Peter even said, no, Lord, you don't need to die. You don't need to. No, you, sh you sh just stay here. What? Jesus said, you're not putting your mind on the interest of God. You're putting your mind on the interest of what? Of man. You only care about yourself. And that's the only reason you want me to stay. But Jesus said, don't let your heart be troubled. Now, I, did, I, I said the verse, I'm sorry I didn't turn you to it, but it was John chapter 14. In, in verses 1 to 6 he is where he tells them that discourse, to not let your heart be troubled. Someone was asking me, where is it, so they could, you know, for their notes, and highlight it. Hi, go ahead, highlight That's a good passage. Because you can tell your friends when they say, why do you think Jesus is going to come again? I tell them, not because I said so. I couldn't even come up with a story like this. But Jesus said it. And he said, and when I come again to receive you, I got a mansion prepared for you. I'm going to come receive you to myself. Like I'm bringing you to the mansion. So that where I am, he says, you may be also. You know, Jesus wants us to be with him. That's the bottom line. The, the, whole, the whole crux of the gospel message is that God wants us to be in fellowship with him. And, and it's because of Adam's sin that, that was spread to this whole entire world we were separated from that sweet fellowship. You know, when Adam was created with Eve in the garden, it says they walked with God. They had fellowship. How, you know, it wasn't like, hey, God, you're way off yonder. They were, they were communing with God in the garden. Would that be nice? Just come on, Lord, let's go for a walk. Got some questions for you, you know. Just, just, I mean, talk about anything. You, you got God Almighty just to visit with you. But sin ruined that. And Jesus came to restore that. And Paul, the apostle, took all that time explaining what Christ did in dying for our sins and being buried according to the scripture and rising from the dead according to the scripture so that he could lead into the fact that, guys, and the beautiful hope is that not all of us are going to die. Now, he believed that back then. So I'm going to say, oh, poor, poor guy. He was wrong. You know, look how long it's been. They thought it was soon back then. Probably the Lord's not going to come back. I go, what gives you that idea? They're like, well, you know, he hasn't come yet. <laughs> I had a question. Do you think we're closer to the day of the Lord's return? Or was Paul close back then? They thought they were close back then. They felt like, God, it could be any time. Back then. I submit to you now, we're a lot closer. You know those signs Jesus said to look for wars and rumors of wars and pestilence and famines? And My wife's like, honey, what do you think is up with all these fires? And there's a fire in Kauai. Our friend, by the way, we need to pray for Steve and Casey. They used to come to the fellowship here. They moved to California. Their house just burnt down. I, yeah, they, they, they had to evacuate. They grabbed a few clothes, they said. And then the next post we see on Facebook the next morning is our house was burnt down. Lost everything. And, you know, the reality of, I mean, think how many people have lost their homes on the other side of our island. How many, uh, what's the count now? I don't even know. 
What is it? 700 plus homes? You know, in, in, uh, in fact, the food basket over here that helps us with our feeding, getting our groceries for the feeding, they asked if we would participate in August um, at the Kona, by, by where the Kona Brewery is. They're going to close that street, and they're going to have a festival, and it's just a basic big fundraiser for the people, the 700 people that lost their homes. And they're asking the churches if we would come from 11 a.m., you know, in the uh, right before noon till 5 p.m. and just help out at the the booths, you know, because everything that's sold, everything that is contributed, is all to raise money to help the people that are hurting over there. And the and the the guy at the food basket is like, could you ask your church to help because we don't have very many volunteers anymore, and we're just over I mean, we're overworked, understaffed, and uh, and yet they're crying, they're crying out for help. 700 homes gone, there's a lot of folks that have lost everything. And they're hurting. You know, every, every single week, people are dropping by and saying, here, I got this, um, I just want to drop this off in case anybody's going to Hilo, you know, side and can bring them some help. And it just, I feel like we're just, <laughs> I feel like our house is a conduit. You know, I'm just like, hey, just keep it going, please. It's just piling up, man. The stuff just keeps coming and I'm just like, Lord, here. But those people are hurting. And it's really a time in, in our world history, you think, with all these fires, all these earthquakes, all this stuff going on, the wars, the rumors of wars, everything Jesus said are the signs that, of his coming. We don't, the kids are like, are there any extra that we're waiting for? I can't think of one. I mean... The Lord's coming could be any minute. And so last week I ended the sermon with, what if the Lord was to come? Are you prepared in your heart? Now only you know if you're prepared for the Lord's return. And, and I can give you an easy assessment of how to tell if you're ready. When you start thinking of the Lord could come for you right now, does your heart get excited? Or do you go, oh no, not yet, Lord. I've got to clean up my act. Because if you're like, oh no, not ready. That means we got a little sin issues that we got to deal with. Okay, we're going to clean those things up and get you ready because this is, a, this is really the hope we have. Guys, we're going to be going to be home with the Lord. And I don't know about you, but I like the whole idea that not all of us have to die to get there. You know, does it seem appealing to you guys that the trump would blow and the clouds would part and the Lord will show up with his with his myriads upon myriads of the ones, believers that have gone before us, coming in on flying horses. And he goes, and he'll just look down, hey, Keith, hey, Linda, come on, come here. And we'll be, the Bible says we will be caught up. The Latin word rapturos, raptured, we get in English. It's a snatching. It's a literal, poof, caught away. The, the, the idea of the rapture has been taught from the scripture for so long do you guys know my the, the right-hand man to Pastor John Higgins, the church that I came out of, Calvary Chapel, Tri-City, years ago, um, his right-hand man was a guy named John Brookhuysen. And so we had John B. and John H. So we just quit, ah, forget, just call Higgins and Brookhuysen. It's just, it's too confusing. But they're both named John for the first name. So we were like, okay, Brookhuysen, you're a pilot. Um, and, you, you know, he believed in the Lord strongly. Very strong Christian man started Christian, Christian aviation outreach. They flew in supplies to missionaries in, in third world countries. I mean, volunteers, pilots that, that flew big commercial jets would volunteer to fly any kind. They, they're already rated for all the little planes. They would fly planes. They would get planes donated, and they would fly them into countries where nobody would want to go. And they would bring relief for those people. And I was like, all right, John, you're so cool. He goes, yeah, I got to tell you, though, um, you know, he was the top at, at the top, top of the, of the echelon of the, you know, the ladder of the pilots at, um, what was it, American? He was American airline pilot? Anyway, American Airlines found out that he's, um, he's one of these born-again Christians. And they said, we, we, we're going to make a rule that you cannot be piloting the plane. Your co-pilot cannot also be born again. And they, 
And no, he he was serious. He told me. He said, "Is you're not going to believe this?" He said, "They literally made a corporate ruling that if you have a born again pilot or co-pilot, you can't have both of them on the same flight together." Do you know why they said that? This is a corporate because the scripture says they'll be caught away in a moment. How long did we say last week? A twinkle of what? Of the eye. And they said, we can't be having both of the, both of the seats in the cockpit vacated. <laughs> now, this is unbelievers. But we don't really believe in God. But just in case one of you guys gets caught up, or two of you, you know, because they had pilots that were cri both Christian. And John used to love to fly with his, you know, co-pilots that were Christians. They had fellowship while they were flying these long flights. And he goes, I can't even fly with any other Christians in the cockpit now. Because the corporate headquarters is worried that we're going we're gonna to get caught up to be with Jesus and the plane would be unmanned. <laughs> okay, you're not, you don't believe in God. You don't think he's really real. But you're going to make a rule that two Christians can't fly the plane together. Just in case. Does anyone see a little bit of kind of goofy, ironic you know, behavior in the world. I mean, that's like the atheist. I don't believe in God. But then when they get in trouble, or they find out that there's something really bad happened, or they, they just were, got the news, they got cancer, they're like, like, and, and you go, um, they're like, can you pray for me? <laughs> you don't believe in God. Uh, I can use all the help I can get. You know, I it's true that, that even, even the non-believer or the atheist, Stick them in a foxhole, they say, because I grew up in a military family. They say there's no atheists in foxholes. When you're facing death, you, you get, your, your mind becomes real clear that you're going to meet your maker. So they, they, it's weird that the world recognizes this, even though they say, we don't really believe it. No, you don't want to live it. You believe it. You just don't want to live for him. But I choose to live for him so that when... That trump blows and that sky is rent in two and Christ comes back for his church. In that moment, I'm going, I'll be gone. And so will all the other believers that have been waiting for his return. And guys, I think we are closer today. I mean, I, I can't actually tell you that there's anything left to wait for for the coming of the Lord. So this should be a hope that makes us stimulated to live like full out for the Lord. I mean, he could come any minute. I hope that this last week you actually, it kind of helped your faith to think, man, am I behaving? Am I behaving like I want to be found behaving? Remember, this is the hope that does what to your heart? Purifies your heart in First John. The hope of seeing Christ purifies your heart. Because you, let me tell you, if you thought he was coming in an hour, do you think that you would be a little bit more, you know, willing to repent of any of your sins? Or, you know, some of those real stubborn guys are like, oh, I ain't, no, you know, that, that guy here fed me, and we've had this ongoing feud for 30 years, man. And Jesus coming in an hour. Don't you think you should take care of it? Oh, I'll wait 58 minutes. <laughs> some people are such holdouts. They're like, if they really knew the hour, they, they, they would wait to the very last minute. But I, I said this in closing last week. If you won't live for Christ now, you're not going to die for him then. You're not going to get it together later. Do it now. Now's the time to get ready. That's the message of the gospel. Get ready. Be prepared for the coming of the Lord. Now Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.